I just want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ricardo Nunez. I'm the Cooperatives Program Director at the Sustainable Economies Law Center. And tonight we're hosted by Impact Hub Berkeley, which is a co-working space here in um, Berkeley. Really awesome space to work and they um, are always willing to give a free day pass if you want to come and come and work here for a day to try it out. So um, that's my little hub, hub Berkeley plug. Okay, <laughs> that's done. Um, so we're really excited uh, to have Michael Johnson here who was co-author of Building Cooperative Power and he's going to um, give us a little talk but then we're going to go into a more general Q&A discussion and um, I'm just going to help facilitate. But um, yeah, thank you very much everybody for coming and uh, Michael if you want to take it away. Okay. So <clears throat> it makes a lot of sense to give an overview of the book in order to when we get down to asking questions and discussion, we know what we're talking about. But I usually do it in a very informal way. But um, tonight we're, we're doing a videotape of it so that we can, we can use this with press releases and post it on the Grassroots Economic Organizing website, which is uh, part, of the, part of the collective. So it's, pardon me if it's a little formal, because <laughs> I want to make sure that I, you know, I, I cover all, all the stuff. Okay, um, so the book is a basically focused on an organization called the Valley Alliance of Worker Cooperatives, and how they developed into an uh, into an organization, and they're with a very very specific focus of creating a regional cooperative economic development project in uh, the, uh, as it, what is called the Connecticut River Valley. It uh, runs through western uh, Massachusetts, starting in southern Vermont down through and Amherst, Northampton, Springfield, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I, um, there's three reasons why we ended up writing this book. Uh, and. Uh, one of the reasons is because regional cooperative economic development or any kind of actual regional alternative economic development is a vitally needed because of the whole global economic and ecological disaster that we're inhabiting at, at the current moment. Uh, basically because they are generative economic institutions rather than extractive economic institutions. The, uh, the second reason is because worker cooperatives and other cooperatives like food cooperatives, uh, credit unions, etc., are premier institutions within the alternative economic movement, which is also globalized at this point. So this is a massive response, at least in breadth, maybe not so much in depth, and that may take time. Um, and so. Just another very reason for, for this story and this book. And it's also a third reason is that it's very locally focused because they are trying to create this regional uh, project in a particular region, the Connecticut River Valley. And uh, the book is to help promote that project in, um, amongst those people as well. And one of the core themes that we're going to get into is the whole issue of a thing called visibility. And, uh, and so the book is one way of making this project visible in, in, in the Connecticut River Valley. Um, and VOC, Valley Alliance of Worker Cooperatives, started out uh, by seven or eight years ago because they had about 9, 10, 11 worker co-ops, some of them 35 years old, some of them 5 years old. And, um, and it, they got together at one conference and they said, you know, why aren't we talking to each other? Why aren't we connecting? And so they ended up, 6, 7, 8 of them ended up doing this. And they did it for a while and it was more like a, like a social group. Uh, and I was uh, uh, I'm a member of an intentional community in Staten Island, New York, and I was involved in a lot of stuff around learning, developing cooperative culture, and I wanted to go out and explore the larger world, 
and and so I got connected to the worker co-op thing and I heard about this project that they were doing and I wanted to go study it and so they took me in and so my first interview was with an old timer there and he said okay these guys these young guys they're in the love fest stage at this point it's about time that they move beyond the love fest into the actual building a development organization because that's what they keep talking about. So I really got there at a key moment because they were starting to make that transition and my first year there uh, was, was being able to get involved and, and experience that. Um, and it, they got that established and then they um, a couple of people did a whole what they call the road trip, uh, uh, the road show. They went from co-op to co-op to co-op to explain, here's the idea, this is what we're trying to start. So in other words, they did the whole organizing project within just the worker co-ops. And then that all happened, that all developed, and then they said, look, worker co-ops can't really have the impact they can have unless we're connected around. And so then they started uh, networking with uh, credit unions and there was a, a, a food cooperative in that area of about 23 food co-ops and they networked with them. And that's how they moved into this whole regional development uh, of, of phase. Uh, their vision, very simply, a vibrant economy where a person can live the whole of their economic daily life cooperatively. If they buy stuff, they can buy it in co-ops. If they're working and they want jobs, they can, you know, there's, there, there's co-ops. And if they want to start businesses, they've got a whole field, you know, of energy and, and support institutions that can do that. Convert, they can do that. So that's, this is the, the, the picture that they, they keep in, in, in front of them. Okay, so that's kind of the reason why we're, uh, uh, you know, we, we wrote, uh, wrote the book. But in writing the book, what are we trying to accomplish? You know, what's, what are we trying to give you and even here out in, in California, et cetera, et cetera. And there's three core objectives that, uh, that we have on this. One is to give a sense, a feel, a taste of what it's like to be in a worker cooperative. So this part of the book was written out of over 40 interviews with people who had been in worker cooperatives currently and all the way back into the 70s in this particular in this particular region. Second was here you have this this premier institution that has 150 years of history and its development very sophisticated business model, very sophisticated set of principles and values. So why isn't the world taken over by <laughs> these cooperatives? <laughs> what is going on? So the second objective is to give a solid understanding of one major factor as to why cooperatives and other uh, alternative economic institutions don't have a place in the economic mind of the people within this country. Invisibility. It doesn't register. Okay? And we'll get into that a little more specifically. And then the third is just to lay out the, the plan that they evolved and developed for uh, regional cooperative uh, uh, economic development. So. I think, personally, because this is the one that I was involved with, with, with most, although I, I'm really excited about all parts of it, so I'll throw that out. <laughs> the first section of the book, which is where we're trying to give people the feel and the sense of what it's like to be in a worker cooperative, is three chapters, the first three chapters of the book. And it really goes into the nitty gritty stuff. It, it goes into, you have to be able to work out problems, consensus making, democracy, hiring, firing, the, you know, the, the pain of having to fire someone because, you know, you're not in an employer's, okay, you got to go, we, 
we got to get to the bottom line here and you're interfering. You can't, that's not the way it works. It really is a heartfelt thing. Um, and uh, this, when I reread that, I just realize how much the people we talk to, their stories, their experiences, our experience of talking with them, how it just wrote those three chapters. And I think my voice says enough. <laughs> um, so that's, that's actually part one, is the realities of worker cooperatives. And the, and, and the second section, <laughs> the second section is actually the story of 11 worker cooperatives, so profiles. So you not only get the feel and taste of what it's like, but here's the story of, of, a, of a diaper service, the story of a, 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 a health clinic, the, the story of a, a collective, a collective copies, which is a, um, a print company that grew out of a, of a strike back in the 80s. And uh, they're the actual publishers of the, uh, of, of, of the book, the uh, work of cost book. Oh my goodness gracious, Tim, hi. <laughs> Boy, we're gonna have a lot of help tonight because when we get into the discussion things, we've got some people here who really know, know this business in, in many ways that I don't. So that's cool. Um, so, I'm here somewhere along in here. Okay, so so the, the second part is these profiles, you know, in which someone gets going through, they're going to say, well, I mean, you can, a worker co-op can do this, can do this, can do this. You know, I mean, it's just the whole span. There's no limit to the kind of business that you can develop a worker co-op for. So that's much, very much part of the whole thing about giving, you know, what this stuff is like and, 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 and what its capacity is. So that's the first half of the book. The second half is focuses on the on the other two objectives. One is uh, this solid understanding. I'm going to repeat it again because it's 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 this visibility thing to give a solid understanding of the one major factor as to why cooperatives and other alternative economic institutions don't have a place in the public mind. And so. We start off that section talking about the cooperative difference. And this just really lays out what the potential power and the value and, and, and the reason why you would think people should really want to know about this and, and, and be involved in them. And it really gets down to this. A capitalist enterprise is designed to generate profits for owners and shareholders. A co uh, it's making capital primary over labor and membership. A cooperative enterprise turns the thing on its head and it's about service to its members with surplus being a tool for that objective. I interviewed uh, one of the founders of the Park Slope Food Co-op in, in Brooklyn, New York. It's one of the biggest food co-ops in the country. When I, when I talked to him, there were 14,000 members and counting. Two or three months ago, there were 16,000 members and counting. Every member has to put in volunteer time. They are four to five, six, seven, eight times more efficient as a business than Trader Joe's or um, uh, the other one, Whole Foods. And Trader Joe's and Whole Foods are three and four times more efficient than all the other supermarkets. So here's this little, you know, and they're super, super efficient. And I asked him, I said, you know, I, while I was walking over here, I saw three grocery stores on the way. And I said, you're competing with these guys. He said, no. We only compete for the hearts and minds of our members. That's the cooperative difference right there. And they're hugely successful 
if they are actually winning the hearts and minds of their members. And that sustains the whole thing. So the second chapter in this section talks about how this cooperative difference is rendered invisible. OK, so here's the deal. It's very, it's very, very easy for you to imagine, you know, going up to somebody, you know, and, and, and saying, you know, well, how do you think the economy's doing? You know, and you get into a conversation, well, Obama really screwed the whole thing. Oh, Obama's really helped us recover, et cetera, et cetera. And where do you think the economy is going to go over the next two years, et cetera, et cetera. All of these conversations are making a profound assumption. And that profound assumption is that there is the economy. And this whole thing that we you get the news reports on, et cetera, et cetera, the unemployment rates and blah, 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 is the tip of the iceberg that shows up. We have been trained and we train ourselves to think of the economy as just that part of all the economic activity that goes on. Neighborhood work, informal lending, volunteering, schools, self-employment, bartering, thieves markets, et cetera, et cetera. This is all economic activity, but we don't think that way at all. So there was, a, there was an experiment that was done. We got a group of people together to watch a videotape of a basketball game, you know, and running up the court and doing this and running down the court and doing that, and blah, 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 and shooting, and all that stuff. And afterwards, they started asking him questions. Well, you know, did you see this? And what did you think? You know, see that, et cetera. And then they asked, did, what did you think about this gorilla that was running up and down the floor with the teams? What? There was no gorilla. I mean, they played in basketball. There was no gorilla there. So they replayed it, and sure enough, throughout the whole thing, as the team, the ball would go up to this end of the court, there was this gorilla running in the background and going up here. They didn't see the gorilla because they're watching a basketball game and gorillas don't exist in a basketball game. That's how cooperative economics and all the other alternative forms are invisible because we think in terms of the economy, which is that upper part. The rest of it is invisible. So. The, the next chapter goes into what are the consequences of this in, invisibility. And there's four basic consequences. As, as, as that's what we identified. First, there's a lack of informed choice for workers and consumers. If you don't know the gorilla is on the court, you're not going to go buy from the gorilla, or you're not going to go look for a, 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 what kind of co-ops are out there to work with. or Who's around the, we want to start one. How can we do this? Secondly, there's a lack of expertise for cooperative governance and management. Go into any university, the School of Business, any university. Uh, I'd like to take a course about worker co-ops. We don't do worker co-ops. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we don't even know where you would go to find anyone doing worker co-ops. And a third one is lack of financial investment and in understanding cooperative development. You can't develop a cooperative business the same way you develop a regular business. And if you don't know about them, you're not going to be interested in investing money in them, even if you really want to do some kind of investing that's, that's uh, uh, socially contributed. And, uh, and then, so, so it's, it's both the, 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 the wanting to put money in a, in a socially creative way, and it's also about um, understanding that if you're going to put money into a cooperative, it's going, the development's going to go like this. It's not going to go like, it's like a regular business. So, but people are going to have a hard time understanding this because they've never thought of 
an investment except in terms of the economy. And then there's the lack of cooperative identity and isolation of the co-op sectors. The co-ops, people involved in the co-ops are very affected by all of this invisibility also. I was, uh, uh, joined the teachers, uh, 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 school district's credit union uh, back in the, in, in the 70s. And um, it was, it was, I got this job, I was in really a hard place, married, two kids, et cetera, et cetera, and we were really squeaking, I got this job, oh my God. We can make it. It needed a car. The car I had was like, you know, rattling all the time. So I needed to get a new car. Didn't have the money. I said, don't wait. Listen, just, you're, you're in the credit union just because you're joining. Just go down there and, and they'll loan you the money. So I went down there. And it was amazing, you know. I, they didn't ask me about my credit background or anything like that. So I got the money and I was, oh, this is great. I love this. No one explained to me you're a member of a credit union. This is what you're, you're doing. You're getting this money because this is the way we're set up. This is how it operates because you're a part owner. And as a part owner, you ought to take and think in terms of what responsibility you want to have. You know, no, it was just like walking into a nice bank and blah, blah, blah. So there was, they weren't promoting the, 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 the cooperative identity. And one of the things you find out is, is that some people don't even know our credit union is a cooperative, and credit unions don't have anything to do with food co-ops, and food co-ops don't tend to have anything to do with worker co-ops. In fact, some food co-ops are very threatened that the workers want to form a worker co-op within the food co-op. So this is all, in part, consequences of the invisibility. And then the final section, the last two chapters, really go into the plan that, uh, uh, that they developed for addressing all of these issues on a regional basis. Because you're not gonna do it as an individual business, you're not gonna do it as an individual kind of cooperative, you're gonna have to create a real network, pull a lot of people together, and that is one hell of a job. But this is the way in which you're gonna bring the cooperative visible to the people in your region. And then this needs to be happening across the country. So, there. <laughs> you turn off the machine now. <laughs>